Father, tonight we just thank you for everything that you're about to speak into our spirit man's. We invite your Holy Spirit to come even deeper and even stronger than he was in here in praise and worship. Father, let your perfect will be done in our lives. Let these truths that you sent forth go deep within our spirits. Change us, rearrange us, and make us the men and women that we're supposed to be for you in this hour. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Barbara sent her message in, so this is straight from the throne room. And it's titled, Faith to Raise the Dead. And if you don't know it, this is where God is going. This is where God has taken his body for us to be able to raise the dead. And there's a lot of dead that's around about us. We're going to start out with uh, Matthew chapter 9, verses 24 to 26, in the easy to read version. Jesus said, go away. The girl is not dead. She is only sleeping. But the people laughed at him. After the people were put out of the house, Jesus went into the girl's room. He held the girl's hand and the girl stood up. The news about this spread all around the area. Luke chapter 7, verses 11 to 15. The next day, Jesus and his followers went to a town called Nain. A big crowd was traveling with them. When Jesus came near the town gate, he saw some people carrying a dead body. It was the only son of a woman who was a widow. Walking with her were many other people from the town. When the Lord saw the woman, he felt very sorry for her and said, Don't cry. He walked to the open coffin and touched it. The men who were carrying the coffin stopped. Jesus spoke to the dead son, Young man, I tell you, get up. Then the, boy, then the boy sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. John 11, verses 38 to 44. Again, feeling very upset, Jesus came to the tomb. It was a cave with a large stone covering the entrance. He said, move the stone away. Martha said, but Lord, it has been four days since Lazarus died. There will be a bad smell. Martha was the sister of the dead man. Then Jesus said to her, remember what I told you. I said that if you believed, you would see God's divine greatness. So they moved the stone away from the entrance. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said these things because of the people here around me. I want them to believe that you sent me. After Jesus said this, he called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. His hands and feet were wrapped with pieces of cloth. He had a handkerchief covering his face. Jesus said to the people, take off the cloth and let him go. Acts 9, verse 36 to 41. In the city of Joppa, there was a follower of Jesus named Tabitha. Her Greek name Dorcas means a deer. She was living, she was always doing good things for people and giving money to those in need. While Peter was in Lydda, Tabitha came, became sick and died. They washed her body and put it in an upstairs room. The followers in Joppa heard that Peter was in Lydda, which was not far away. So they sent two men who begged him, hurry, please come quickly. Peter got ready and went with them. When he arrived, they took him to the upstairs room. All the widows stood around him. They were crying and showing him the coats and the other clothes that Tabitha had made during her time with them. Peter sent all the people out of the room. He knelt down and prayed. Then he turned to Tabitha's body and said, Tabitha, stand up. She opened her eyes. When she saw Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her stand up. Then he called the believers and the widows into the room. He showed them Tabitha. She was alive. Do you feel your faith building right now? 1 Kings 17, verses 17 to 23. Sometime later, the woman's son became sick. He became worse and worse until he stopped breathing. Then the woman said to Elijah, you are a man of God. Can you help me? 
Or did you come here only to remind me of my sins and to make my son die? Elijah said to her, give me your son. He took the boy from her and carried him upstairs. He laid him on the bed in the room where he was staying. Then Elijah cried out to the Lord. He said, Lord, my God, this widow is letting me stay here, letting me stay in her house. Will you do this bad thing to her? Will you cause her son to die? Then Elijah lay on top of these, lay on top of the boy three times. He prayed, Lord, my God, let this boy live again. The Lord answered Elijah's prayer. The boy began breathing again and was alive. Elijah carried the boy downstairs, gave him to his mother and said, look, your son is alive. Second Kings thirteen twenty one, Some Israelites were burying a dead man when they saw that group of soldiers. The Israelites quickly threw the dead man into Elijah's grave. As soon as the dead man touched the bones of Elijah, he came back to life and stood up on his feet. We all are surrounded by people who are dying in one way, shape, or form. Some of them from COVID, some of them from other diseases. I know someone right now who's in a battle for his life, dealing with aneurysm. And this is a timely word and a timely message because we speak life to this young man and we command life to return to his body. We rebuke the effects of this aneurysm right now in Jesus' name. And as a body of believers by faith, we declare that he shall live and not die. We declare a complete turnaround. We declare that his brain will function as God has ordained for it to function. And you will get the victory, not the enemy. This is our time, saints, for us to use the word of God and to destroy the works of the enemy, destroy the weapons that he has placed against the body of Christ. We, as the body of Christ, should not be fearing anything. We should not be fearing sickness. We should not be fearing death. We should definitely not be fearing COVID-19 at all. Do you know in times past, the great revivalists and the great ministers of God, they would put viruses and things around them and they would die? This is the level of the anointing that God is bringing upon us now. You got to step in faith. You, you got to step into it and stay in it and never leave it and not be afraid of what people are saying and what people are doing. You shouldn't be afraid of somebody who has AIDS. You should be able to go up to them and love them with all of your heart and, and know that that virus inside of their body is dying because of the presence of God that's inside of you. This is where God is, is taking us. This is what God wants to do right now in this season. God wants us to walk in these same miracles. And we have to, you know, it's past time for birthing this in the spirit. It's time for us to walk this stuff out. It's time for us to carry this forth into the streets. And we're starting to hear different reports of people in the body of Christ who are praying and stepping out in faith. And they're praying for the people that they're around about. Brother Allen was telling me a testimony tonight of somebody he prayed for and they received a healing in their back. This is, has to become commonplace for the believers because the world is looking for us to carry the truth. The world is looking for us to carry the anointing out to them. They're hungry. They want this. And we've got to stop fooling around with the things of God and get serious. Matthew chapter 16, verses 16 and 19. Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus answered, You are blessed, Simon, son of Jonah. No one taught you that. My father in heaven showed you who I am. So I tell you, you are Peter, and I will build my church on this rock. The power of death will not be able to defeat my church. Do you understand that? Do you really understand that? The power of death will not be able to defeat God's church. Are you God's church? Is he in you? Verse 19, I will give you the keys to the kingdom. When you speak judgment here on earth, that judgment will be God's judgment. When you promise forgiveness here on earth, that forgiveness will be God's forgiveness. Do you understand that God has given us these powers as believers to forgive one another's sins? You see a brother struggling in sin and they're repenting and they're, they're, trying, they're crying out to God. You have that power and that authority to say, God forgives you, move on. 
God forgives you. Don't walk in condemnation, guilt, and shame. Move on. This is the power that he has placed on the inside of us. And we have to start using it more and more. Same thing with judgment. People don't want to talk about God's judgment and the believers uh, using judgment against, you know, the wicked and, and the wicked in the body of Christ and the wicked in the world. It's there. It's, it's scriptural truth that this is what the body of Christ is going to be doing. And what greater sign and wonder for an infidel to come in and say, and curse our God, and for us to say, you be cursed for cursing our God. And then they fall down dead. This is the level of the power and authority that we're going to start walking in now. Not tomorrow, not next year, right now. This is the time, this is the season that God has called us into. Question, do you believe Jesus is the son of God? Do you really believe it? Or is it just a, a passing fad? You know, right now, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on and, and, and they're doing things based upon popularity, the popularity of people, you know, the popularity of President Trump, the popularity of President Biden. What's going to happen when all of those popularities pass away? People are going to disappear. They're going to go into their closets. God isn't going anywhere. You're not going to shove him in a closet. You're not going to keep him down because his glory is going to be seen in this earth, whether people like it or not. Do you believe Jesus is the son of God? If you do, then Matthew 21 applies to you. Matthew 21, 22, all things, all things, whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive them. You shall receive them. We need to understand that everything you do, every breath you take, every step you take is because you're headed for the great white throne. You're going to stand before God and give an account of what you've done. And wouldn't it be awesome for you to be able to say, Lord, look at all these souls behind me that I brought into your kingdom. Look at all these people that, that you use me to raise up from the dead. You, you use me to bring them out of their dead religion, their dead works, their dead processes that they thought was going to bring them closer to you. You use me to do this. And you're standing before God's great white throne, not bowing, hoping that you make it in, but you're standing there with confidence and full of his glory, knowing that, God, this is what I'm bringing to you. This is what I'm presenting to you. This is the offering that I have. Different thought, isn't it? Different thought. Matthew 21, 22. All things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive them. When we pray and things don't happen, we need to blame the right one. There has to be a judgment. There has to be an evaluation. It's not, it is, it is not God's fault. That's a judgment. It is not the person's fault you're praying for. That's a judgment. It is not Satan's fault. That's a judgment. Why isn't it Satan's fault? Because Satan cannot stop the power of God. He can't. He can't. And if there's something wrong, or if there's something in your thinking process that puts God below Satan, tonight you need to get that cleared up. You need to get that out of your thought processes. You need to get that out of your mind, will, and emotions because that's going to be a hindrance to your faith. That's going to be a hindrance to these scriptures that we just read inside of your spirit man that need to go forth and destroy the works of the enemy. Satan is not bigger than God. We say that to the devil all the time in exorcisms. It, and and, and it, it shakes him, it wakes him up because the truth is he's not. Satan is not more powerful than God. We have to accept the responsibility. We are the doorway that is blocked. We are the log jam. We are the problem. It is not Jesus and the devil cannot stop the power of God. So when we deal with this head and get our head out of the way and go to our heart and let our heart connect with the faith, then we're able to step into and do what God has called us forth to do. No 
terrible malady of, of any sort should stop God from being able to move, should stop you from being able to release your faith and cause the miracle that somebody needs to have happen, happen. Matthew 18, verses 1 to 4. About that time, the followers came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in God's kingdom? Jesus called a little child to come to him. He stood the child in front of the followers. Then he said, The truth is, you must change your thinking and become like little children. If you don't do this, you will never enter God's kingdom. The greatest person in God's kingdom is the one who makes himself humble like this child. I want to read that again. Matthew 18, 1 to 4. About that time, the followers came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in God's kingdom? You ever stopped and thought about that? Why are they posturing and trying to position themselves? You know, I, I halfway believe that they wanted Jesus to tell them you are. And, and he, he, he pulled this child up and said, you're not, in a way. He pulled this child up and, and got them to get off their focus of themselves and to realize that they needed to get this straightened out. About that time, the followers came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in God's kingdom? Jesus called a little child to come to him. He stood, in, stood the child in front of the followers. Then he said, the truth is, you must change your thinking and become like little children. If you don't do this, you will never enter God's kingdom. The greatest person in God's kingdom is the one who makes himself humble like this child. We must become like a little child to enter the kingdom of God. It is not the manifestations. It is not the great power you possess. It is not your great abilities. It is becoming like a little child and using the gifts of heaven in your life. When you humble yourself and allow the Lord to use you, that's what makes you great. That's what causes God to be noticed and to be glorified in this earth realm. You may ask, how do we operate in the supernatural flow of God? If you study the Bible, you will learn that from Genesis to Revelation, there is a common flow through all of the prophets apostles, and men of God. They all went towards God from the same direction, prayer and fasting. This is where it's at, prayer and fasting. That is the ultimate act of submission of your will to the Spirit of God so that God can move and do what he needs to do. Prayer and fasting gets your flesh out of the way, gets your mind out, and your will and emotions in alignment with God so that he can do what he needs to do. When we're operating under the anointing of prayer and fasting, everything is different. We've done a lot of fasts in here over the years, you know, and, and it doesn't matter the length. Some of them have been 21 days, some of them have been 40, some have been three or 10 or seven. It's the fact of your obedience because you're obedient to turning your, your fork down and turn your plate over so that God can speak to you and manifest his power through you. You know, you look around today and they have these food banks and these food drives all over the place. A lot of people are, are without. What happens when those things dry up? What are you going to do? Are you going to be trusting and dependent upon God to supply your needs? Are you going to be able to fast when there is no food without grumbling and complaining? This, this is serious. This is serious. If, if, if you have not noticed, if you've not stopped and seen, every city and town in Delaware is passing out food in some way, shape, or form to people because the poverty level is, is great and is strong. And the lines of people waiting in these lines to get food are long. It's, it's, it's something that's a need. It's, it's a necessity. So as the body of Christ... We need to get in line and see what the needs are and understand what God is doing. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 2. Then the Spirit led Jesus into the desert. He was taken there to be tempted by the devil. Jesus ate nothing for 40 days and nights. After thus, he was very hungry. It says Jesus hungered. 
And you can look in Isaiah 58, verses 6 to 14 for more reference, references on fasting. You need to understand that the only thing that is important at this given time is to see the supernatural flow of God work. That's the only thing that's important right now. We need to be moving heaven and earth. We need to be moving our lives, everything that's going on and on a daily basis out of the way so that God can use us and so that we can step forth in this miracles that God is calling us forth to do. It does not matter that your flesh is crying out for food, especially when God is calling for times of fasting. We, we need to be obedient to this. We need to fast no matter what is going on. What matters is that there is a need that must be met in another soul. Can you imagine how bad you would feel if you didn't have the anointing to be able to set someone free? If God has spoke to you privately and personally and said, I want you to fast for the next two days and you didn't do it. And then all of a sudden, boom, all hell broke loose around about you. But if you would have fasted, you would have been able to help set the people free that were going through the hell that they went through. So sometimes we have to understand that there's a greater purpose in ourselves and not be navel gazing and looking at our own selves and our own bellies, trying to figure out, you know, well, God's going to do something great for me, you know, because I'm fasting. You know, it's not about you. It's about the people that God is sending you to, to minister to. You're fasting and you're, you're storing up that anointing on the inside of you so that you can reach and minister to the people that God is going to send your way. It's, it's critical right now that the body of Christ understands this. What matters is that there is a need that must be met in another soul, soul life. And we are the conduit between them and God. They need the fire of heaven on them. They need zeal in them. They need compassion. And we as born again believers have that in us. And for us to not get it to them is a sin. Do you understand that? We as born again believers have that in us. And for us to not get it to them is a sin. We have to do our job. We have to do our part and con continue to remain open before the Father so that he can use us as the vessels of honor that he's called us forth to be. This is the time in the season where he needs hands and feet and, 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 and eyes and, and mouths and ears to be able to speak and to do his works. And we can't say no. We can't say we're too tired. We can't say not now, Lord. We have to go forth and do what he's calling us forth to do. Worry about resting later. <clears throat> Matthew 21, 22 says all things, remember that, before this work will come for you, sorry, before this will work for you, you must come out of immature and lustful thinking. Before this will work for you, you must come out of immature and lustful thinking. You must think for the kingdom of God as you do what? As you go. You must think for the kingdom of God as you do what? As you go. As soon as you set in your heart that I'm going to go and do whatever God wants me to do, that's when the anointing is going to hit you. That's when the things that you have need of, your provision is going to, is going to be there for you. As long as you're sitting around, wringing your hands, holding yourself, none, none, of, none of the things that you need are going to be there. But as soon as you determine in your heart, I'm going and you make that first motion forward, Everything is going to fall in place. It's going to be right there for you. What are you going to do when you get there? You're going to preach. You're going to preach. Now, sometimes you may be whispering while you're preaching. Sometimes you may be talking in a normal tone. Sometimes you're going to be yelling. But preach. you got to tell the truth. What are you going to preach? The kingdom of God is near. It's near. We don't know when, we don't know how far, but we know that it's nearer than what it was yesterday. It, it, it is. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And after you're completely in the will of God, what are you going to do next? 
Heal. Heal. After you heal the sick, what else are you going to look for? Cleanse the leper. Raise the dead. After you raise the dead or cleanse the leopards, what are you going to do? Cast out demons. If you don't understand right now, this is one of the most prosperous seasons for God to move in exorcisms and deliverance. You don't understand what's really going on right now. Devils are flying out of people right now. They just are. And we're not the only ones. Other members of the body of Christ are doing exorcisms and they're having marvelous successes because they're yielded to the Holy Spirit and God is doing this because God wants to raise the dead. Not only physical dead, but the spiritual dead. He wants to bring people out of their bondage completely. Why? Freely you have received, now give it to others. Again, it's not something that's supposed to be heaped into ourselves. Man, I'm apostle five times over. I'm the greatest prophet that ever walked the streets of Wyoming. You know, dumb stuff that we think. I'm better than this other church because we can do these things here. Wrong thinking. It's got to go. It's got to go. You're hindering your own anointing. You're hindering what God wants to do through you because you're focused on yourself. Wow, how great am I? You're, you're not that great. You really aren't. <laughs> in, in as long as you start thinking that you're great, you're limiting the anointing that God is placing in your life. You're keeping him from being able to use you to raise the dead that he's called you forth to raise. Matthew 10, verse 27 to 28. I tell you all this secretly, but I want you to tell it publicly. Whatever I tell you privately, you should shout for everyone to hear. Don't be afraid of people. I wish the body of Christ would just take this and just run with it. Don't be afraid of people. They can kill the body, but they cannot kill the soul. The only one you should fear is God, the one who can send the body and soul to be destroyed in hell. Don't be afraid of people. They can kill the body, but they cannot kill the soul. The only one you should fear is God the one who can send the body and soul to be destroyed in hell. We are to speak only what we hear. We still need to work on this body of Christ. Only what we hear, not what we think, not what we see. Only what we hear. We're not going to be intimidated. We are not going to turn our backs and run from the enemy. We're going to stand. We are. And we're going to keep standing, united as the body of Christ, standing in the holiness and purity that he's given us, and we're going to complete the assignment of raising the dead that are before us. It's our time. It's our time to do this. Let your faith rise tonight like never before in this area. Just like we are commanded to do in the full armor of God, don't go with a lopsided, out-of-balance message. Preach the whole gospel. It's the whole gospel that's anointed, not part of it. You can't say, I only believe in this part of it and not the other part of it. And a lot of people are doing that right now. Don't, don't, don't read the Old Testament. You know, I, I, only, I don't want you to read Revelation because it's too hard for you to read. If you read it, God will give you the understanding that you need to read it. He will give you the revelation that you need to get out of it. The whole gospel, not half of it. Don't go with only the helmet of salvation. Don't go with only the shield of faith. You will be destroyed if you do those things. You take the time to clothe yourself in the armor of God. I'm telling you right now, this is a word from the Lord. Because this is, this is where the rubber meets the road right now. And the body of Christ is not placing the armor of God upon themselves. And the enemy is tearing them up. We're not going to be this way. We're, we're going to remember the armor of God. And we're going to put it on every day. Then you confront the enemy 
the enemy of God, and you do not back off from him. Then you confront your enemy, the enemy of God, and you do not back off from him. I was kidding with my wife last night about breaking the peace, the peace treaty. A lot of, sometimes the people in the body of Christ have this peace treaty. Devil, if you don't, if you don't mess with me, I won't mess with you. You need, you need to throw that away. You need to get that mindset away and out. Burn it, destroy it. You need to set in your heart. I'm tearing your kingdom down. I wish you would come over here. I wish you would try to take someone's salvation away from them. We're going to pray. We're going to intercede. We're going to fast and make sure that you don't. We're going to stand and you're not going to keep binding and afflicting my brothers and sisters in the body of Christ because we're standing in the truth, in the glorious light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And nothing can stop us because the devil is smaller than God. Smaller. Make him back off. Mark 3, verses 1 to 5. Another time, Jesus went into the synagogue. In the synagogue, there was a man with a crippled hand. Some Jews there were watching Jesus closely. They were waiting to see if he would heal the man on a Sabbath day. They wanted to see Jesus do something wrong so that they could accuse him. Jesus said to the man with the crippled hand, stand up here so that everyone can see you. He didn't hide it. Then Jesus asked the people, which is the right thing to do on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil? Is it right to save a life or to destroy one? The people said nothing to answer him. Jesus looked at the people. He was angry. It's another scripture that said Jesus was angry. That's amazing. Y'all need to log this one down. <laughs> Jesus was angry, but he felt very sad because they were so stubborn. He said to the man, hold out your hand. The man held out his hand and it was healed. Are you going to be afraid of people? You have that inner nudging. I want you to speak and cause those things to be not as though they are and break the power of death over this person, no matter how silly you think you look in front of somebody else? Are you going to go lay hands when God tells you to go lay hands? You can't be afraid of people anymore. If God has given you a word, a knowing, now is the time. It's time to raise the dead, just like God has been saying. Mark 3 Verses 10 to 12. He had healed many of them, so all the sick people were pushing toward him to touch him. Some people had evil spirits inside them. When the evil spirits saw Jesus, they bowed before him and shouted, You are the Son of God. But Jesus gave the spirits a strong warning not to tell, he, not to tell anyone who he was. Mark 3.13. Then Jesus went up on a hill and invited those he wanted to go with him, so they joined him there. Jesus went up on a mountain and called to him those he wanted. Now, you're those people. He's calling you. You are called. You are the called up on this mountain. The second part of this verse says, and they came unto him. He has called us unto him. You have come to him. See this in your spirit, man. See this in your heart and your soul and know that you've made this step already. You've come forth. Mark 3, 14. And he chose 12 men and called them apostles. He wanted these 12 men to be with him and he wanted to send them to other places to tell people God's message. The second thing that is very valuable here is that they were sent. Do you understand that you're being sent? You're being sent. It's not important what you do inside of here, inside of these four walls. What's important is what you do outside in whatever church you attend on a regular basis. It's not important what you do in there, but it's, it's important what you do when you're sent out. The Bible says he ordained them, appointed them, that has happened to your life. 
you are ordained and appointed by God to go forth and raise the dead. This is the call that he's placed upon everyone that's here. It's not an accident that you're here tonight. That is why you feel compelled and drawn and sent and pushed out. That is why you feel compelled and drawn and sent and pushed out. You have been ordained by heaven. What they were, what were they ordained to do first? Mark 3, 14. Then he appointed 12 that they might be with him. They were ordained to be with him. As long as you remember that, you will never go astray. As soon as you start thinking that you don't need God, you don't need Jesus, you don't need the Holy Spirit, you can work the miracles by yourself, you're in trouble. You always have to remember your first place, and your first place is to be with him, to be with God. The first thing, you heard the call of Jesus. The second thing, you responded. The third and most important thing, you must spend time with Jesus. A lot of people get this confused and they want to make it very, very complicated. God bless you if you do lay out on the floor for hours upon hours. But if you're working, if you're tending to your family, if you're tending to your business, you can still be close to God. You can still spend time with Jesus. Let that set in your spirit. Sometimes we place limitations upon God and say, oh God, I can't pray for half an hour at a time. I can only give you five minutes. God is not judging you for that. He's not holding that against you. He's looking at the nature and the intent of your heart. And if you're driving along the road, going somewhere, and you're talking to God, you're spending time with Jesus. If you can do the other thing of laying out, that's awesome too. But most people can't. Most people are, are, are full of, of works and ministry that God has called them forth to do. And that has to take precedence. That, has to, that work has to be done because these people have to be reached. You must spend time with Jesus. It says in the next verse, after after they spent time with Jesus, then he sent them out to preach. Preaching is not the first. Preaching is the second. So again, to be with him, spend time with him, then you preach. You are valuable and you are important to the world, but you are useless without the presence of Jesus. That's the most important thing. You are useless without the presence of Jesus. After you spend time with Jesus, then he will send you to preach. Mark 3.15, to have power, authority to heal sickness. And the fourth thing is to cast out devils. Remember, that is not the first thing, that is the last. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will ask us to do things that nobody else has ever done. And you have to step out in faith and do those things. God will be with you. As you trust him, as you're obedient, he will give you the anointing that you need to complete the works that's, that's necessary. We might be asked to go places and to fight with warlocks, principalities, and religious demon spirits. God may ask you to do that. When God asks you to do these things, always remember that these things need to be bathed with prayer standing in the presence of God and fasting. They all have to work together in order for the power of God to be seen and to be moved upon his people. The body of Christ needs the fire of God. The body of Christ needs to thank Jesus for the blood that he shed. His blood was pure and not sinful. And his blood can be used and applied at any time in your life at any time in your ministry, at any time for anything that you do. His blood makes us clean and gives us relationship with God. His blood is perfect. 
Always remember that his blood is perfect. Our father sends us forth with perfect anointing to do the greater works. If you notice, God has been calling us to go forth. He's sending us forth to do the greater works in this hour. And this message that that God sent in, faith to raise the dead, is a continuation of what he's doing. Now, he's given you the tools. He's given you the faith. And tonight, he wants to complete and seal this authority and this anointing. And he's inviting you to come forth in the altar so that he can send you forth with the faith to raise the dead tonight. The altar is open for you to come and to receive everything that God has for you tonight.